a rained off game close to zero attendance in another a few one-sided affairs two test playing nations pulling out a dull 78 run target these have been some of the face-offs at the t20 world cup so far and don't get me wrong there have been a few thrilling moments too like namibia's win over oman in a super over usa's aaron jones striking a blistering 94 of 40 balls to help usa register a win against arch rivals canada and the heartwarming stories some of these associate countries and their players bring to a world cup make for compelling narratives no doubt but i ask in the desire to play the good samaritan here has the icc failed in a few of its key deliverables i'll explain now, what are some of the great things that the ICC wants to achieve via this World Cup? Take cricket as a sport to uncharted territories. So ICC zeroed in on USA. The Big Apple is big money. So what if all the venues here are not massive or cannot seat a usually big cricket viewing crowd? Let me put this in perspective. Stadium capacity in US, the Nassau is the largest. Seats 34,000 or thereabout. Then comes, of course, Laura Hill in Florida that seats 20,000. And then there is the Dallas ground, which seats merely 7,200 spectators. These are the three venues in USA for a World Cup event. Now compare that to some of the biggest in other countries that has hosted big events, such as the World Cup. In Australia, Melbourne is the largest, seats a lakh. In New Zealand, Wellington seats 35,000. In South Africa, Wanderers in Johannesburg seats 34,000. In the UK, Lords seats around 32,000. India, the Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad, can seat a lakh and 32,000 people. And here's the thing, these countries have other venues that also have a large seating capacity. But I get this initiative, it's an attempt to grow the sport. The other goal, of course, is to increase the associate country's count, bring more competitors for a seat at the table. So this edition has seen nine associate teams, the most for any T20 World Cup. USA, Canada and Uganda are making their T20 World Cup debuts and Nepal comes in after a massive gap. USA played their first T20 international just five years ago. It's a melting pot of players from different countries, including India and New Zealand. Canada is no stranger to cricket. They've appeared in four World Cups but never crossed the group stage and it's the first time at a T20 World Cup. Uganda is making its T20 World Cup debut after eight failed attempts to qualify. So a big, big moment for them and their country, I'm sure, is rejoicing. Nepal, who are making their T20 World Cup appearance for the first time in over 10 years. They last featured in the 2014 edition. So all of this is great to see, heartening for the sport. But has ICC really prepared well for what comes along with noble gestures, at least in this edition? Let's look at the first, Cricket in Americas. It's a country that has never hosted a mega cricket event. We cannot count Major League Cricket or that All-Stars mini tournament that Sachin Tendulkar and Shane Warne orchestrated years ago. This is a World Cup that requires a certain level of infrastructure in place, logistics, planning and the right kind of execution in various departments, starting with the venue. The very first match played at Nassau, Sri Lanka versus South Africa, has brought the venue under sharp focus. Sri Lanka managed to make just 77 batting first, and South Africa reached the target after 16 excruciating overs. It needed some amount of aptitude to play on that track, sure, but the pitch is already raising many eyebrows. How will the other tracks play is a question many are asking, and as India plays Ireland today, one of the things in focus will be that pitch. But it was not just the drop in pitches garnering the criticism. Even the outfield was very slow with puffs of sand spurting in certain patches. Not the kind of T20 cricket that fans are used to watching around the world thanks to the leagues. And this display coming from proper teams who've played the sport for decades, Sri Lanka and South Africa. Which brings me to the second area of concern, too many associate countries. Now, while in one way, bringing in some fresh energy, raw talent onto a big platform could jazz up the World Cup. It's probably a good notion to begin with. Maybe a few of these hungry countries will put up quite the show, who knows? But then it also opens the possibility and the door to some heavily skewed one-sided affairs. Like when some of these sides play the big boys in India, England and Australia. And that does little for the sport, the fans and the players. 
T20 cricket fans are now used to action-packed matches, high-scoring affairs, blistering hits and tight finishes with some maverick bowling efforts. That's what a seasoned cricket fan and a new one in America are paying to watch. Are they going to get all of that, the best of T20 cricket action throughout the tournament? Now let's see this from ICC's point of view. Their aim is to grow the sport and while any good Samaritan act is done with little or no expectations of what you will get in return, ICC or the various stakeholders in this unique venture cannot function with that thought alone. America is all about the big dream. It sells that, the big city, the flashing lights. Everyone comes here to realize the big American dream. So have the ICC. But did they prepare well for all that comes with this? The issue of timing for one. In trying to do the tightrope act by taking cricket to its biggest fan base on television, which is the subcontinent, including India, have they shortchanged the spectators at the venues? Many of whom might have flown from various parts of the world just to watch cricket in USA. We hear stories of fans selling cars to travel to America, right from Australia, only to watch the cricket, driving a whole day just to get to the venues. Then there is the issue of the venue itself, the logistics, the trappings that make it essential for any event to be a success on the ground. Is all of that still a work in progress with the tournament underway? Is the ICC waging a lone battle in a time where league cricket is nailing the basics and succeeding in giving all its stakeholders what they want? First Post reports from the world's second largest continent. Hello, I'm Alison LaGrange. A very warm welcome from Durban, South Africa. We get you the news and the newsmakers from Africa. South Africa goes to the polls on the 29th of May. I will track the election and bring you ground reports. Is it the end of the road for the African National Congress? And will former President Jacob Zuma stage a dramatic comeback? From elections to climate change, to innovations and opportunities. As the world's attention shifts, we report from Africa, the heart of the Global South. Join me every weekday live on First Post. <laughs>